Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Now, we've been on this series, The Core, uh, for several weeks now. We've gone through all four of Calvary's four core values, um, and we've peppered in a couple of extra sermons in there. And this week, I have the honor of stepping into the next part of the core series, and that is we're going to be spending the next few weeks talking about Calvary's five essential doctrines. And I say that, and many of you in this room just went, oh, man. Many of you in this room went, okay, first off, what's a doctrine? And second of all, what makes it essential? Well, a doctrine is any kind of belief that someone may hold, whether it's a person or an organization. Uh, So these doctrines are essential to Calvary because we believe as followers of Christ that these five doctrines are essential to our faith. In other words, these are five doctrines that we believe as Calvary Baptist Church that they are essential to being a follower. If you can't identify with these five doctrines, you might not be a follower. And so let me list off the five doctrines. Also, uh, if you hear these and totally space out on me or, or want to go back and, and look some more at these, they can be found on our website, calvarylhc.com. Um, By the way, we redesigned our website last week. It's very snazzy. It looks really good. So even if you're not interested in these five essential doctrines, you should go to our website and check out the new design. It looks amazing uh, and has lots of great resources for you. So, but here's the five essential doctrines. The first one is the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. The second one is that there is one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The third doctrine is that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. The fourth doctrine is that all people are sinners and need the grace of God. And the fifth and last doctrine is that salvation is only through faith in Jesus. Those are the five beliefs that we find to be essential to call yourself or qualify yourself as a follower of Christ. These are the five doctrines that we will never under any circumstance budge on. We will discuss them, we will talk about them thoroughly, and in most every sermon that we preach, there's, there's an element of these five beliefs, these five doctrines. So we'll discuss them, but we will never, ever consider deviating or changing any of these five doctrines under any circumstance. These are the doctrines that the Bible is black and white on. Now, What's the difference between an essential doctrine and other important doctrines? Well, if I was to survey this room about the end times and how the end times were going to happen, I'd probably get a couple of dozen different ideas on how the end times are going to happen. And it doesn't matter what your stance on the end times are or how it's going to happen. You can still call yourself a Christian as long as you have a life-changing relationship with Christ. But with these five essential doctrines... You'd be hard-pressed to call yourself a Christian if you don't agree with them. If you can't agree that Jesus came and was God and he lived a sinless life and died on a cross and rose from the grave, you can't call yourself a Christian. Because Romans 10 tells us that that is what you have to believe in order to be a Christian. If you don't believe that we are all in need of grace, then you're going to have a hard time calling yourself a follower of Christ. These are the five essential beliefs that we hold as Christians, and everything we believe here at Calvary revolves around these five statements. So that's what we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks, and I get to introduce it by giving you the first essential doctrine, and that is this. The Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. About 15 years ago, 
give or take. I was in college in Texas. Um, it was spring break, and normally during spring break, uh, I would go to uh, uh, on a mission trip down to South Padre Island, uh, pretty much going and ministering like you would down at the channel at spring break. Uh, but I'd go on this mission trip with a, a church organization that I was affiliated with, but this particular year that I'm talking about, I wasn't able to get the time off for my job that I needed to go on this mission trip, so I didn't get to go. Uh, but my job did let me take off like the last half of spring break, and I had a buddy of mine named Ryan who was in the same boat. He couldn't take off the whole week, but he could take off the last part of the week, and so Ryan and I decided that we were going to take a road trip. We were going to drive from Amarillo, Texas down to San Antonio, Texas, because the mission team that was down in South Padre, on their way back up to where we lived, they stopped in San Antonio and had a nice afternoon on the river walk and ate out and uh, got to have a great time. And then they stopped in a small town not too far away and ministered for a day. Uh, various things. One year we helped a food bank and one year we worked on a house and one year we uh, you know, helped a church out doing some stuff. So we thought, we'll go down, we'll meet up with them in San Antonio, have some fun, then go surf for a day and come back with everybody. Great plan. So Ryan and I hop in my small Chevrolet S10 pickup, and which was awkward for Ryan because he's six foot four. And so we pack into my small truck and we head down to San Antonio. Now from Amarillo to San Antonio is basically just back roads, totally uneventful trip. But we get onto I-10 and we come into San Antonio and as we're coming in, we realize... We have no idea where we're going. We knew that we needed to meet up with them at the River Center Mall, which sat right on the river walk. And we knew that about two or three blocks away, there was a huge tower called the Tower of Americas. It had been built for a World's Fair or something like that. And you could see this tower from most parts of the middle of San Antonio. And so we thought, well, we'll come in through I-10 and, and we'll just look for the tower. And when we get close to the tower, we'll take an exit and we'll, we'll navigate our way through wherever and find the tower and then we can find the mall. So we're driving down and Ryan goes, okay, there's the tower over here on the left. Okay, great. So we, we kept going. He goes, okay, now we're getting really close. We should probably exit. I was like, okay, yeah. So we're driving down Interstate 10. We take the exit, looking to the left to you know, go to where the tower's at. And we exit and realize that there's no option to turn left to get to the tower. And so we took the only option available, so we turned right. And we ended up in a neighborhood where, let's just say, Ryan and I did not fit in at all. We were probably the only people within a one-mile radius of our particular race and ethnicity. Um, let me describe myself back then. This is like late 90s probably, I was same height obviously, probably about 15 pounds lighter, and I had that very preppy popular 1990s, like, I don't know how to describe it, I call it the butt cut, it was where long hair split down the middle, you know, long and preppy, anyways, I was as white as white could be, and we were in an area that was as non-white as non-white could be. This was the kind of area that as you pulled up as we pulled up to a stop sign, and I, I'm not exaggerating on this, we pulled up to a stop sign and there were people sitting on the corner. And I'm talking about they brought their lawn chairs and that's all they did for the day was sit on the corner. And when they turned and saw the small Chevrolet S10 pickup with two white boys in it, they stood up and started walking toward my truck. Ryan and I were scared out of our mind. Long story short, we navigated through the neighborhood. It literally took us 30 minutes to get out of that neighborhood and get back on Interstate 10. We ended up 10 miles up Interstate 10 from where we had already come. We went down Interstate 10, and lo and behold, they had a sign showing you where to exit for the Tower of the Americas, of course. We took like two exits previous to the sign. We were idiots. So we met up with our group and had a great time. But something fundamentally changed in me that day. I don't ever go on a trip without a detailed map of where I'm going. 
Now, that's easy nowadays because I can pull out my phone and say, okay, Google, take me to Walmart, and it will give me a turn-by-turn. It even has a very friendly lady who says, in 200 feet, you need to hang a left, and it's very easy now. But this was the time before GPS. I don't even think I had a cell phone in that day and time. But from that point on, every time I went somewhere, I had a detailed map of where I went. If you've ever been on a youth trip, if you've been a driver on a youth trip with me, one of the first things you get is a thick folder full of maps and turn-by-turn directions with every possible bathroom break and Starbucks along the way. (laughs) Hey, when you're with youth students, you need coffee. So I have changed the way I travel based off this experience. And now, even on family trips, I have a detailed idea of where I'm going and how to get there and what's along the way. And hear me when I say this. If you don't hear anything in this message, hear this sentence. The Bible is our roadmap to life change. The Bible is the roadmap that leads us to life change. It's important. I'm going to assume that most of us in this room would like to be better people. Some of you in this room were forced to come and you're here not of your own free will and you could care less about Jesus, but I'm hoping that you want to be a better person. And the fact is, is that the Bible is the roadmap that leads us to being a better person, that leads us to life change. You see, If you take Proverbs 3 that I told you to turn to a minute ago, take Proverbs 3 and open it up to verse 5. There's a passage here I want us to read. It says, uh, verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Guys, We have to trust in the Lord and the guidance that he's given us through his word. And that's hard because as I say that, I know that many of you are asking the question, yeah, but can I really trust what the Bible says? The Bible is a 2,000 and older document. I mean, some of the words that were written in your Bible were written 3,500 years ago. Can I really trust something that was written 3,500 years ago? And here's my answer to you. Simply yes, but let me explain why I give you that answer. I've got a master's level degree in theology, and I've studied God's word in and out, and I'm actually kind of a a semi-quasi expert on apologetics. It's one of the things that I love to study. And so I've studied God's word and its accuracy and its truthfulness for many, many years. And ultimately, it comes down to one argument for me. We can trust the Bible because of this one statement. The Bible is the only book that has ever been written in all of history that is written by an all-knowing, all-wise all-powerful, never-changing, all-present God of the universe. That's why we can trust the accuracy of the Bible. If an all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, unchanging, all-present God wrote this Bible, when he wrote the words 3,500 years ago, he saw what happened in Paris two days ago as he was writing these words. So we can trust them. He saw the culture that we live in today when he wrote the book of Genesis. So it applies to us today just as much as it did 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago or 500 years from now. Because the book, the Bible, is not just a compilation of 66 books thrown together They are the actual words of God. If you go to 2 Timothy 3.16, you'll find a passage there that talks about how every word in the Bible was actually breathed out by God himself. In other words, 
every person who wrote one of those 66 books in the Bible, they were either listening directly to God. In other words, there, there are books where God was literally speaking to someone and someone was just writing down what God said. In other books, it was a situation where the Holy Spirit literally guided the hand of the, right, the person who wrote it. This book contains the actual words of an all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, unchanging God of the universe. That's why we can trust the Bible. Because when he wrote the words, he had all of history in mind, and he wrote a book that applies all through history, no matter what point in history you find yourself in. So we can trust in it. If you gave me a road map of Lake Havasu City, and let's face it, we all need roadmaps to navigate Lake Havasu City, right? I've been here six years, and I don't go anywhere without my GPS. I even have a backup map in the back of my seat just in case. If you gave me a road map of Lake Havasu City, but it wasn't accurate, the streets were wrong, would that road map be any good to me? No. I can't trust it. I can't depend on it. But that's not the case with the roadmap that God has provided us. The fact is, is the Bible is the most accurate and trustworthy book that has ever been written because of who wrote it. Because of the knowledge and wisdom that God has. So, the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us next what to believe. We've talked about it being inerrant and inspired. Now it tells us what to believe. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's living and active. It literally discerns through our hearts and our thoughts, our intentions. The Bible is more than just a book. It has a living aspect to it. And the reason we want you to know God's word and know what to believe is because if you know what to believe, you're going to know God better. And ultimately, isn't that what Calvary is all about? Leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Let me give you a scenario. Let's say later on this week you're hanging out with friends or coworkers or somebody and you're talking about things and uh, they ask what you did with your weekend and you say, oh yeah, I did this, blah, blah, blah. And you mention that you came to Calvary on Sunday morning and you listened to Pastor O.C. preach. And your friend or your coworker, whoever that you're talking with, responds with, oh, I love Pastor O.C. <laughs> Everybody loves Pastor O.C., and then they go on to describe a six foot seven behemoth of a man with long flowing blonde hair who's devastatingly handsome. They got one of three out right. But the fact is, is if they're describing a six foot seven tall man with long flowing blonde hair, it's probably not me. Because I'm nowhere near six foot seven. I'm a solid foot shorter, and I haven't had hair since I moved here. Well, nothing more than stubble. So the fact is, is if that's the person they describe, they're not talking about me. They may think they're talking about me, but it's not me, is it? Guys, there are a lot of people talking about Jesus out there. But the Jesus that they're talking about is not what's described in this book. And guys, let me be very blunt with you here. If it's not the Jesus in this book, it's not Jesus at all. It's an idol that has been fashioned for their liking. That's why we want you to read your Bible and know what to believe because we want you to know who Jesus is. We want you to be able to have a relationship with him. If I, on, my, on a typical day, I go home, I see my wife and I see my son and uh, Jana and I will hang out with Knox and uh, later on we'll put him to bed and then Jana and I generally will sit down and, and spend some time just talking about our day. 
talking about life, talking about our relationship, uh, talking about the news. And, and we'll chit chat and talk. And um, do I do that because I have to, because it's my duty as a husband? No, I do it because I want to have an ongoing relationship with my wife. Now, if I decided one day that I was just going to not talk to my wife anymore, that I didn't need to communicate, that my relationship with my wife, communication was not necessary, and I went home and never talked to her again, never spoke words to her, what would happen to my relationship with her? It would fall apart. It would crumble. The very foundation of my relationship would shatter. But don't we do that with God? We take our Bible off the shelf on Sunday morning, we bring it to church with us, and we open it up to Proverbs 3, and we read through the passage, and then we take it back home, and we put it on the shelf, and we don't spend any time reading it, and we don't spend any time in prayer. How do we expect to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ if we're not spending time communicating with him? How are we going to get to know God if we're not talking to him and getting to know him through prayer and the word? That's why we want you to read your Bible and know what to believe. Because ultimately, The Bible leads us to know him better. That's the the goal. You can know what the Bible says all day long, but unless you have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter. We want you to know him. The second part of that last half of the statement is this. It tells us what to believe and how to live. How to live. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says this very simply, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers. Don't just listen to it and not act. Be doers. Act on what God's word tells you. See, if you gave me a road map to Lake Havasu City, and this time it was accurate and trustworthy, and I picked I'm here at point A, and I want to end up at point B, and I decided that was the place that I wanted to end up at, and I did not take the roads that led me to point B, what's the point in the map? What's the point of me even looking at the map if I'm not actually acting on it? If I'm not going to follow the directions that that road map lays out for me? Same is true here. If the Bible is the roadmap that leads us to life change, then we have to do what it says. So if you come to church this morning and then you go out in the community and you're a hateful, vindictive, manipulative, greedy, hateful, fight-causing person with a complete lack of self-control, then is anyone going to want the Jesus that you claim to follow? No. As a matter of fact, they're probably going to want nothing to do with it because you that Jesus has nothing to offer them but if you read your bible and do what it says you're going to read galatians where it gives us the fruit of the spirit and if you do what it says that means that you're going to live with others in love and peace and you're going to be a person of patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control You're going to be a person that literally is the hands and feet, the image of Christ in someone's life. And that's what someone might be attracted to. That's what someone may go, what is it that you've got that I don't? Because you act differently. You love people when it's hard to love them. You're patient and peaceful with others when it's hard to be patient and peaceful. You're gentle and kind when no one else around you is. You have a level of self-control that I don't have and I want it. That's what people are attracted to. But if we're not living that, what's the point? You see, if the, bro- if the Bible is the roadmap that leads us to life change, if you follow that illustration, it means that we have to follow the directions that it lays out for us. We have to say, yes, 
God, I see your direction in your word here, and I will follow that direction as you lead me through it. But if we're not willing to submit and follow his knowledge and his wisdom and his guidance, the Bible does us no good. We want you to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ and to go live out that life change. And the Bible is the roadmap that will lead you to it. But let me paint you some scenarios. Can you imagine, for just a moment, if every person who claimed to be a Christian on the face of the earth suddenly one day decided, we're not just going to say we're Christians, we're going to live it out day by day. Can you imagine what this world would look like? Can you imagine if every person who claimed to be a follower of Christ stopped being greedy? If every person who claimed to be a follower of Christ stopped being impatient and hateful and hurtful? Can you imagine what this world would look like? How it would change if people lived out their faith? And you go, yeah, that's a little bit too big a picture. Plus, it's not realistic. Okay, let me narrow it down just a minute. According to current statistics on poverty in the world today, it is a fact that if every church attender just in the United States managed their finances the way God's word tells them to, poverty would stop. If we as American Christians simply managed our money the way God told us to in his word, there would never be a nine-year-old boy starving to death in Africa ever again. There would never be a homeless person starving to death on the streets ever again. Poverty would end if American Christians would simply follow God's word. You go, well, that's a little bit too big a picture, plus it's not realistic. Okay, let me narrow it down just a minute. Can you imagine if every person who attended Calvary Baptist Church this weekend decided today that they weren't just gonna say they were Christians, they were gonna live it out by doing what God said. Can you imagine what the 1,500 of us, how we could affect the 50,000 of the people in this community? Can you imagine how this city would change if just Calvary Baptist people, just you sitting in this room, would say, I'm gonna be a person of love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? Can you imagine what Lake Havasu City would look like if just we decided to do that? This town would change and flip on its end. There would be a revival in this town, the likes that which you've never seen. People would come to church in the droves because they would see a change in you and in me. Still big picture. Can't imagine that. It's a lot of people, 1,500 people, okay? Let me narrow it down for you a little bit. What if, imagine, if every person in your home decided, you know what, we're gonna follow Christ and we're gonna do what the Bible says even when it's not easy, just in your home. Children would honor their father and mother. Parents would stop yelling and having outbursts of anger with their kids and their spouses. Children would grow up as healthy functioning, godly adults. Spouses would never go through a problem that they could not navigate through God's word. They would communicate. They would live godly lives. Their finances would suddenly come in line with God and would start getting healthy. Can you imagine what would look like in your home if everyone in your home started following what God's word said? Well, it's a little bit too big of a picture. I mean, I'm the only Christian in my home. You haven't met my kids. Okay, let me narrow it down one more time. Can you imagine if you decided today, I'm going to stop living the life I want to live and I'm gonna live the life God's word tells me to live? I'm gonna read it on a regular basis. I'm gonna pray. Can you imagine how your life would change? Can you imagine the relationship with your God, how it would improve? Can you imagine how the relationships that you have with other people in your home and in this community, how those would change if you were a more loving and forgiving and merciful and compassionate person? If you were less greedy and hurtful and hateful and self-absorbed? 
Can you imagine how your life would change? Just like I illustrated a minute ago, I don't go home and be silent around my wife. I talk with her. I talk with my God. It's life changing. It's life empowering. And if you will take 10 minutes a day as as a way to start out, 10 minutes a day and pray and read your Bible, your life can change as a result as well. And many of you are going, I have no idea where to start. Let me help you there. If you've never read the Bible and you would struggle to do so, first off, find a decent translation, something you can understand. King James probably is not the best one. I don't read Shakespeare a lot. I don't read the King James. It doesn't make sense to me. But find a good translation. Take one of the Bibles that's in these pews and take it home with you. Download the YouVersion app on your phone and read the Bible off your phone, whatever it takes. But take 10 minutes. In the first minute of that 10 minutes, you sit down with God and you say, God, I recognize that this book is living and active and I pray that you would help it be alive to me today. And you open either the book of Matthew or the book of John and you read that book from start to finish. Don't skip around the Bible all over the place. Read a whole book. Matthew or John, start there and just read start to finish. And then come ask me where to start the next, what book to start after that. If you would do that 10 minutes a day, all of us have 10 minutes a day, If you would take 10 minutes a day, it could change your life. It could change the lives of the people around you. Can you imagine the impact on your children if your kids walk in and they see you sitting down reading your word, genuinely reading your word? Can you imagine the example that that's gonna be when they're adults? We can change our lives, our homes, our communities, and this world if we learn what to believe by reading his word, live it out, and invest in his word through an ongoing relationship, we can change things. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to pray, to worship, to to hear your word, but God, our desire today is that you would give us a hunger to read this, that you would give us a desire to read your word and let, us, let it change us from the inside out. We thank you so much, God, that you gave us your word. But help us to recognize its truth and to go and read it so that we know what to believe and how to live. We thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship.